This is the round table on curatorial and artistic strategies around activism, representation, and collective space. I want to say thank you again. We can't say it enough to Jamila and Lanka for organizing all of this today. It's been really amazing. And thank you all for hanging in there. Um, my name is Sarah Williams, and I'm the managing director of Women's Center for Creative Work, which is a arts and feminist and community space here in LA. Um, we're going to try to keep this really conversational. We're going to try. Um, so everyone, all of our panelists are going to give a really brief about five minute introduction to their work and then we'll just launch into some questions and hopefully leave a good amount of time for all of us to join in a conversation together. Um, I'm going to start, I'll start with Courtney and introduce our panelists and hope that we have Colleen. <laughs> um, so Courtney Fink is an arts organizer and curator based in Los Angeles, California. She is the executive director and co-founder of Common Field, a national network of independ independent visual arts organizations and organizers that connects, supports, and advocates for, artist -centered, for the artist-centered field. From 2002 to 2015, she was the executor, ex executive director of Southern Exposure in San Francisco. She serves on the board of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and the Seed Fund that has held, and has held positions at California College for the Arts, Cap Street Project in San Francisco, as well as Franklin Furness in New York. For nearly 25 years, Courtney has been dedicated to developing the capacity of artists and the systems that support them. Next, we have Kate Johnston who is a graphic designer and a co-founder of Women's Center for Creative Work. Her practice melds the forces of language, identity, ideation, communication, strategy, and making. In 2013, she and two others co-founded the nonprofit organization, the Women's Center for Creative Work, with a mission to cultivate LA's feminist creative communities and practices. Kate currently serves as the WCCW's creative director. She is also principal of her freelance design practice, Radical Rules, the editor and art director of Pants Magazine and founding member of Collage Collective, Confetti Confidential, and an adjunct faculty in the MFA graphic design program at Otis College of Art and Design. She holds an MFA in graphic design from CalArts and a BA in classics from Pitzer College. She lives and works in Los Angeles. Next, we have Young Jun Kwok, who's an LA-based multidisciplinary artist working primarily through sculpture, performance, video, and collaboration. Her work aims to change how we view our bodies by reimagining their form, functionality, and materiality from static and bound to pre-inscribed power structures to an expanded sense of bodies and their environs as mutable and open-ended. She is the founder of Mutant Salon, a roving beauty salon slash platform for experimental performance collaborations with her community of queer, trans, femme, POC artists and performers, and the lead performer in the electronic dance noise band, Zena Zerner. Woo! <laughs> Performances and ex exhibitions include the Hammer Museum, the Broad, Red Cat, One National Gay and Lesbian Archives, um, Regina Rex and Smack Mellon, Brook, uh, Southern Exposure, the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Um, Kwok will be the artist in residence at LACE during summer 2018 and was recently awarded the Arts Matters Grant and the Rima Hort Mann Foundation's Artist Community Engagement Grant. She received an MFA from the University of Southern California, an MA in Humanities from the University of Chicago, and a BFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. And last we have Colleen Smith, who is an interdisciplinary artist whose work reflects upon the everyday possibilities of the imagination. Operating in multiple materials and arenas, Smith roots her work firmly within the discourse of mid 20th century experimental film. Drawing from structuralism, third world cinema, and science fiction, she makes things that deploy the tactics of these disciplines while offering a phenomenological experience for spectators and participants. Smith was born in Riverside, California, and grew up in Sacramento. She earned a BA in Creative Arts from San Francisco State University and an MFA from the University of California, Los Angeles, School of Theater, Film, and Television. Smith is the recipient of several grants and awards, including the Rockefeller Media Arts Award, Creative Capital for Film and Video, Chicago Three Arts Grant, and the Foundation for Contemporary Arts Art Artadia Award, and the Rauschenberg Residency. Smith was the 2016 recipient for the Herb, Herb Albert Awards in the Arts in Film and Video, and is the 2016 inaugural recipient of the Ellsworth Kelly Award. Would you like to, <laughs> would you like to start us off, Colleen? Do you want to do your presentation or no? Is that okay? Camera is rolling. Uh, interior take 1A. Ready? 
Hi, <laughs> I'm Young Jun Kwok. Um, I'm an artist working in several different mediums, uh, as Sarah said. Um, primarily sculpture, performance, and collaboration. I'm drawn to these modes of working because of the connections and how they deal with bodies in space and can lead us to thinking about bodies as beyond a discrete organic thing and think of multiple forms of matter as bodies in an expansive, liberating way. Um, I also just want to preface this talk by um, mentioning that my particular critical interests by which I navigate art and life are kind of at the intersection of queer and feminist theory. And for the sake of uh, time and more specific discussion, um, I'm not going to be talking about my object-based or sculpture um, practice, and I'll just be focusing on uh, mostly Mutant Salon and Zena Zerner. So in 2011 in Chicago, <laughs> outside of an art context, um, I started performing as Zena Zerner with my partner Marvin Astorga, in which we combined DIY and power electronics, mutated vocals, and bad drag to create cathartic, satical, um, I, I think of satical, sad and radical, noise, diva, dance songs after years of being unsatisfied performing drag and lip-syncing songs that longed for the love and validation of a man at gay bars. I wanted to perform my own songs that spoke to an originary traumatic core, embracing the other identity, the other identity, <laughs> that uh, um, one doesn't choose but is forced on you as a queer trans femme person of color. Our performances took place mostly at house shows, bars, like alternative art spaces, a queer trans, um, oh, queer nightlife and underground punk venues outside of a professionalized art context. Our performances were about creating sites of collective mourning in which feelings of shame, grief, and melancholia that create material loss for queer, trans, pe uh, people of color, and women could be shared and commonly felt through dance. Through Zena Zerner, we were able to connect with disaffected kids, queer or straight, urban, suburban, or rural, on tour, to make weirdos feel better about weirdos, as my friend and musician Rotten Milk would say. Um, yeah, and like live performance, I'm a, I'm a larger woman, <laughs> and I like get in people's faces. I like to be in the crowd on the same level, and my friend Carolina told me that I'm you know, my presence, like physically as a body, is like that of a, a mother or a guardian. There's this tension between interrogating, implicating, and then also just like tender, embrace, and loving. Uh, I started Mutant Salon in 2012 after moving to LA, initially because I needed to make my studio partially into my dressing slash makeup room because I didn't feel safe to get dressed and made up in my apartment in my new neighborhood. We continued to perform as Zena, Zer um, Zena Zerner shows out here, where we found such a strong, supportive community of queer, trans, POC, women performers. And I would see performance art at galleries, and then playing at these shows, like in moldy basements late at night, witness these performances at these you know, non-art venues that blew my mind and made me wonder, why isn't this at a, in a gallery? I had the privilege of having the space, financial support, and platform that comes with institutional backing since I was in grad school at the time, and I wanted to extend this safe space with my community to collaborate with them, to bring my community from the outside in. Um, these are some of the people that have been involved with Mutant Salon in past, present. Um, at the top left corner, that's the uh, Project Rage Queen, and. Um, moving from left to right, uh, um, Oscar Santos from Sister Montos, Elliot Reed, and then on the bottom row, Sarah Gail Armstrong, uh, Sancha, and Ceriza. Um, Mutant Salon became a roving freeform salon slash platform for collaborative performance and community building that fosters connection between queer, trans women, POC communities um, taking place in and outside of 
uh, galleries and institutions like Red Cat, Hammer, and The Broad. In past iterations of the salon, I've created with other artists to create the environment of the salon using objects, light, sound, video, where performers and audience members could get makeovers, just haircuts, psychic readings, makeup, nails, bodywork, tattoos, etc., where the line between the stage and the audience could be blurred, where performers and audience members could learn from each other about each other's stories, bodies, other forms of connection, discordances. Um, it is crucially about this collective production of knowledge and shared impulse slash experience in imagining a different world from our own. I think of Mutant Salon as the green room or the war room, the space of preparation and planning. I think of Mutant Salon as a temporary autonomous zone, to borrow a term from Hakim Bey, a non-space that can lead to, lead one to, you know, a possible someplace the other ways. Um, and so at Mutant Salon, there's also kind of like discrete performances that take place. Um, at the, uh, on the right top, we went out, that's like outside of the Broad Museum, and starting from the bottom left, uh, that's Rea Tep who organized the L LA Zine Fest, and you know, we wanted to highlight uh, um, uh, writers and, and zine makers and um, music, and um, the right, hand uh, corner, that's Barbara T. Smith, a performance artist based in LA who led like a, a healing um, improvisational collective sound uh, yeah, piece. Um, we are also different from each other, but we have in common our own varied experiences of resisting and surviving the harmful effects of the objectification, exploitation, policing, and outside attempts of discrimination and domination over our bodies. In Mutant Salon, we collectively counteract the damaging, dehumanizing effects of being objectified through mutually objectifying each other. What artist slash writer Gordon Hall calls reparative objectification. Quote, interfacing with one another as bodies, but doing so in a way that supports rather than tries to destroy one another to treat each other like objects in profound affirmation, to learn to see each other, to look at one another as bodies and say, yes, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> we could be covered in trash, monstrous, but still beautiful because we make each other beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I wanted to, for my part, as a way of introducing myself and my practice, um, define for myself a couple of the terms that are in the title of this roundtable. Um, specifically, I wanted to define for myself activism and representation. Um, I am a graphic designer. I serve as a creative director of the Women's Center for Creative Work, um, which Sarah and I are co-directors and founders of. Um, we have a space in Frogtown. We enable the f feminist creative communities, uh, projects and practices of Los Angeles with um, almost nightly programming. We have a shared workspace. We have project incubation, residencies, and lots of really great stuff. Um, I think about activism a lot in terms of my own practice because I do self-identify as an activist. However, in my personal practice, it, my activism doesn't generally take the feats on the street form. Um, as a designer, my form of activism that I've chosen is communication. So specifically, I want to enable something like a protest or a workshop or a meeting to happen by communicating the pertinent information about it to the any given audience. Things such as how to park for something and where the bathrooms are. Um, I care a lot about these kinds of information. I feel as though if somebody is made comfortable and like isn't late because they know where to park and they know where the bathroom is and they know they can use it before they come to sit down at a meeting. Once there's this level of comfort in a space, then, then the activism can begin to take place. Um, Women's Center started 
um, with some, our first events were dinners. And we had this idea that if you can sit down across the table and you can have something good to eat and drink and you're comfortable, then you can begin to have to talk about how to form the revolution. Um, and so I see my practice as laying that table, um, both physically and that we have dinners sometimes, but also um, in a more metaphoric sense um, with graphic design. Um, in a broader level, I create and maintain our um, digital platforms, such as our website um, and our publications, our analog platforms like our publications. And these are touchstones for audience engagement. And I also see this creating these platforms as an activism. Um, once there are these shared frames of reference, like an Instagram feed or a website that people can return back to, there can become this idea of a collective audience. And once there's this collective audience, they can be enabled to advocate. And so I would, I identify myself as an activist because I see my practice as creating these platforms in which to enable an audience to advocate. So it's kind of a funny definition. I realize it's kind of like pre-activism or, or like laying the table for activism, but I still consider myself existing in that realm. Um, representation is another word that I wanted to define for myself. This is a really funny one. I, I'm really interested, as a designer, designers are trained to make things very clear, but I, I'm really interested in this tension between defining something and make it very clear in order to facilitate this traditional idea of intention or letting something be thick or viscous. And when it is thick or viscous, there can be this form of resistance, but then how do you maintain that intention? I don't really know the answer to that. I just keep trying to go towards it. Um, as an example, if you go to the Women's Center website, there are, there's an, kind of an infinitely expanding um, grid of icons. And the icons lift, link to specific programs that we have, and each uh, graphically has a re relationship to that program, but also as a whole, these icons are view are the rules for the like the style guide. So, like as I define it, is that each of these icons need to be graphically varied as possible. So some are photos, some are vector. There are different styles and qual and qualities to these icons. And in this way, I I feel like we are trying to go towards an idea of representation of a many of a of a varied and a many and a whole, but a whole that is made of, of very different disparate pieces, and each one of these can exist on their own, but when they share space together on this flat, like, digital plane of the Women's Center website, I'm trying to go towards this idea of making something thick, but also creating intention. I don't know if it's successful or not, but I'm interested in iterating. I'm also interested in feedback. <laughs> so, thank you. I guess I'll go. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you to all the organizers. And um, actually, there's, quite, there's at least 10 people in the audience who are part of the Common Field Network. So it's always exciting to see. Um, yeah. Um, so. Um, my role is um, as an arts organizer. Um, I don't identify as an artist. And um, I came out of a practice of working at and running several nonprofit arts organizations, art spaces, um, most recently Southern Exposure in San Francisco. And during, during those many years, um, there was a real void of um, connectivity in the field and um, a larger national connection uh, between these many, this very expansive, slightly unknowable field. Um, and so colleagues across the country um, who had met over the years decided, um, with some um, historical precedent, of course, because there had been networks that had been active in the, in the 80s and 90s, to start um, Common Field. And basically, Common Field is a national network of um, artist organizations um, that are experimental, non-commercial, and non-profit, 
Um, and the goal of the organization is to connect and support and advocate on behalf of the values of um, those organizations. Um, and the idea really was is that we want to organize as a field in order to strengthen one another through um, collective action and shared information and mutual support. Um, and making the field more visible and clarifying really how critical of a role it plays in the larger arts ecosystem. Um, and more than other networks, I think Common Field, even though it's only three years old, is really attempting to take a position, i.e. Uh, one of um, resistance, um, and has principles that it works towards in a very unique way. Um, and I think that uh, posi uh, positionality creates a type of um, advocacy that we're building towards. Um, so I wanted to just keep this as brief as possible because I'm really excited about the conversation, but I'm gonna read something really quickly that was just co-authored by, uh, we're also very uh, collaborative, and uh, we just published an essay in um, Terremoto, which is an art magazine published in Mexico. I'm just gonna read two paragraphs um, authored by two of our founding uh, members that I think does a good job at kind of addressing the question of this panel. Um, so a dominant question throughout Common Field's um, emergence has been how exactly this field hangs together as a coherent network, an assembly of artist-run, artist-centric, or self-organized projects that is expansive and essential rather than disconnected and marginal to the broader activities of the art world. From the network's founding documents to the activities of its 700 plus members, Common Field is a multi-hyphenated, disparate, and unable to be distilled down to an easy description. It is perhaps a question more of positionality than structure, bottom-up, outside-in, singular to common. Our contemporary times have uh, been viewed as those racked with the failure of um, institutions, governmental, financial, ethical, and of course cultural. The institution, as it is fundamentally understood, is a center of power, a distillation of forces into a whole. The institutional art world is, com is a common foil for the work of these small arts organizations, projects and spaces that make up common field. That world of institutions carries certain codes, hierarchical decisions, um, making processes, dominant power relations, compromised funding models, colonial histories, and a pervasive white male Eurocentric viewpoint. In the US, many museums, but also the broader nonprofit industrial complex, as well as academia at large, tend to be slower to respond to calls for decolonization, direct action, and disinvestment from problematic patrons. The independent or alternative mode of working is a necessary resistance balance to those tendencies that opens up new ways of working, forefronting equity, mutuality, and uh, liberation. The existence of Common Field as a quickly growing network opens up a viewpoint in which the other form of independence is imagined as a larger and more expansive and more interwoven than the centrality of the institution. Dependent on collaboration and solidarity, rather than on forces that undermine the messages that they present, this network, in an attempt to forward organizational forms tied to communal ethics and shared benefit, offers a kind of counterpower, advancing tangible models and examples in the present, tactics towards ne next steps, and reimagined futures. All right, um, I think we'll sort of riff on Kate's uh, conversation about identifying as an activist or not, and I'd love to hear kind of from all of you whether you do or do not in your work identify as an activist, and also to kind of toss it in there if it's applicable, how this current political climate, however you might um, define that, ha has or hasn't shaped your, your work. I wanted to I wanted to talk about that the the idea of activism its relationship to art and um, my discomfort with with um, being mistaken for an activist um, <laughs> in the sense that a lot of the things that I make they look like they steal from the tactics of activism and they look like activism um, but um, I'm not really interested in negotiating for power um, I'm interested in some other sort of maybe smaller disturbance in individuals. And so activism doesn't quite 
Uh, activism has like a much more ambitious goal, which is to, to make change, which requires agreement among large numbers of people, which speaks to a lot of things that actually I'm, I'm um, really resistant to. And so I guess I'm appropriating tactics of activism, um, not because I'm not interested in change and not because I won't show up for agendas that are about change and negotiating power, but because there is another way uh, for us to all be together and be in this world together and make it better. There are other ways. It's not just the streets on the feet on the streets model to, to make change and to engage with humans, their minds, their imaginations. And, um, uh, and, and, and so we don't all have to do that work. And some of us aren't even good at it. So um, I, I just wanted to be really clear about that from the beginning, that I, I'm not sitting on this panel as an activist, but as someone who steals their tactics for other means. Yeah, yeah I, I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't identify like as an artivist as like the term, you know, has become recently. I've been hearing a lot of, but every time I like give a talk or am in front of like a public, you know, it invariably comes up and it usually comes up as like a question of, you know, how do you justify that? And, um, and you know, I think that by virtue of using our bodies and you know, just who we are, I think that always gets kind of brought up, you know, the body is political. Um, but yeah, I also just feel like identifying as an activist as like a kind of representative of a group of people to campaign for a large, you know, group of people is a sort of privileged position. Some, so in some cases, you know, I think it's like very, very, you know, um, important for, you know, certain political, um, you know, pieces of legislation and whatnot. But as an artist, I don't, you know, the message is different. I, I'm more about like kind of asking questions. Um, yeah, and also just specifically with Mutant Salon, there are just so many people involved and I can't speak for everybody and, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I spoke of this before in my introduction, but I had a, a quick response to what you said, Jung, where I'm trying to think about the, the privileged position of, or being asked, which I have been asked before, to speak for a group of people is very uncomfortable. And I think that almost that asking comes from this place that's rooted in capitalism where there's this comfort in totally identifying something and drawing a circle around it. And I've been asked like, what does feminist graphic design look like? And I like, I don't, I, I can only speak of my own work. I don't, I, I would never, it seems so inappropriate for me to talk about, especially something like feminism, which I like to talk about feminisms. Um, it seems inappropriate. So I wonder if it's like, this asking impulse that sometimes happens, it comes from a pl like a place where the understand, it's kind of like wanting to understand something so that you can just not have to pay attention to it anymore. Like it's like, oh yeah, I know what that is and now I don't have to care about it or something. I don't know. Um, I, def I mean, I definitely feel like a absolutely common field there is a response to the moment and I think it's it's really good timing that we were organizing you know over five years ago because a lot of these platforms that we work with they have very little agency or voice on their own but there's tremendous power as a group and I think that's what common field I think is really important for I think we're still getting there and I think we have to sometimes acknowledge that um, we're not there and that's okay uh, because we're still really building, and in terms of what it means to literally represent more than 700 organizations that are anything but common, they're quite uncommon, and there's actually not a lot of commonality if you really think about it, but in essence, the, the expansiveness of, of how many groups are coming together with some shared values and with artists at the center of that work um, is, is really interesting. And 
um, we almost think of it as, as movement building. I mean, it truly is like building a national alliance, coalition, movement of uh, not like-minded, but interested in similar um, ideas and trying to articulate um, how to thoughtfully and um, carefully uh, represent that. And so the question about um, is Common Field a voice for the field, or are we a platform for uh, participation to amplify what the field really thinks and wants to say? And you know, I'm not really talking in specifics, I'm being quite vague, but one way we do that is we have an annual um, convening. Uh, we just had a convening here in LA in November, where more than 450 people gathered from around the country, and in 40 sessions, um, really challenge, challenging um, a lot of those notions. And I think the work is really hard and it is, act, it is activist. And I think um, the reason it feels so hard is because things aren't working and they really need to change. Um, and so I do think that, that that's a big part of the work. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll go to the, uh, the idea of sort of collective space and you talked about being a platform, Courtney, and I think that's something we think a lot too about at Women's Center and, um, yeah, I think in different ways, each of your practices play into an idea of, of creating collective space or organizing, creating with others. Um, I guess I'd like to hear from you each a little bit about how you think of your role as an organizer or I was doing a studio visit with Young June and a reluctant leader or collaborator or hosting was also a nice concept that came up. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about that. Just, um, whoever, whoever, not necessarily. Um, yeah, in terms of it being like a collective space, I think, you know, I feel like my role is very much about kind of creating the space and kind of inviting people that I feel like, you know, their voices are kind of under-recognized and, and also just thinking about um, the whole, just how these, all these fragments could come together and the interactions like kind of that are somewhat, you know, unpredictable too, you know, what could happen when you put, you know, all these different voices side by side and then, um, and you know, like I, I, in terms of like hosting, I feel like, yeah, I'm like kind of creating the stage, setting up the space and like putting objects and stuff like that, making it in welcoming and inviting and strange and I, and then like, you know, the performers kind of create the space too and, um, you know, Mutant Salon is what it is in the moment when everybody involved is kind of envisioning it together, including audience members or participants, and, and you know, and then from there, you know, people kind of take that away from the experience and then kind of, you know, could fold it into, um, you know, just uh, their, social relations and I don't know I mean, if that's activism maybe I am an activist <laughs> I, uh, I got really excited listening about listening to the development of an organization through dinners and through the mm -hmm. just the fundamental practice of hospitality and it had me in a really strange and urgent way thinking about Kesu uh, talking about the way that there is no no part of the land on which we live right now that isn't owned by something or someone. Um, and that there's a, the, the fundamental like reality of, of where we live and how we are able to live here. And like the scale and magnitude of what hospitality actually is in practice is, 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 is enormous. And I think about it all the time in terms of um, just <clears throat> on, a, on a base layer um, how much is at stake by actually giving everything away or on a fundamental level of um, um, refusing sort of like our rules around ownership and our, our, um, uh, our, our little, all of our little parcels about all of our little ways of being in the world if we kind of just give them away and then, and then and like sort of put them in the middle of the table and see what's useful to, to someone else or see, figure out what it is we really need. And I'm talking about on the most minute way, just in terms of like, um, our mundane way, like things like identity, um, 
or on um, epic or really scale ways like genocide or um, like North America or South America or Africa or Asia. Um, uh, like that kind of scale. So uh, um, I don't know. So that's what, when I was, that's, that's what you had me thinking about. Can I ask how that plays into your work? I was reading an interview, I think, in Bomb Magazine with you, and there was, I'm, I don't have the exact quote, but thinking about the um, sort of the exchange that happens with people who might be participating in the filmmaking process. Oh, I guess. yeah. Yeah. I don't <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just so being trained as a film director and like you're, um, you're, you're, the, you're the general. The only, the, the, the only real appropriate terms for the description of what a director is all come out of war um, <laughs> and colonization and, and power and control. And so um, just thinking about, uh, um, as I sort of move towards contemporary art and social practice being like the thing and listening to what the goals of social practice artists, what their goals were, were the kind of things that as a director you do like at 4 a.m. just to get your shot. And that um, there's like something really useful about like the ability to sort of like command and organize and, and take up and occupy space, but it's also really crucial to be aware of what that means and how you're reenacting and reinscribing sort of, you know, really, really violent colonial practices. I don't know if that's what you're asking, yeah, but that's that what was, I think about now. Great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I was just sort of thinking about like the physical descriptions of meals and <coughs> mutant salon, which I've, I've experienced firsthand. And then I was sort of thinking about like the strange meta virtual space of common field, which is this massive expansive field of amazing activity that we are like one step removed from in a weird way because we are online. And it's like Hannah and I and Amanda sitting in a room um, trying to figure out what everyone is up to. So it's, it's interesting, this like collective space that we're trying to build is also reliant on people engaging. And um, collective space is complicated to make, actually. It's really hard to get people who are really dedicated to their work, who are already probably not getting paid to create these alternative frameworks, um, to ask them then to go one step further into um, advocacy and involvement and sometimes even having to spend money to do it. So it's interesting to think about um, organizing. And I never really thought of myself as an organizer and uh, some of the founders of Common Field make a really strong case about um, why they don't like to call themselves arts administrators anymore and why they really want to own uh, Actually, the language we use is extremely intentional. We literally will meet and debate for hours about one word because if we're trying to invent a new narrative, the way we talk about it's really critical. Um, and so, um, yeah, so arts organizer, um, you know, someone maybe who started this work when that was not a term that was being used in the, in the mid-90s, um, it's because they see themselves more aligned to um, organize, like community organizing, and that it's not, it's not an active, it's actually more of an active, changing, change agent kind of role. Um, and so, yeah, I think because uh, the needs are so urgent, and actually because a lot of these projects are usually the most risk-taking, that are on the front lines, they're often operating in spaces where there's no other, no one else, like even in their county or region. Like we, uh, we have um, people in almost every state. We have a, a huge uh, rural arts um, contingency where they're operating in very uh, conservative climate. So I think uh, how you protect yourself when you're trying to speak out, when you're trying to support something more radical or more experimental, um, and just creating a community around that is really interesting. Yeah, so it's, de it's definitely... Uh, it's interesting to see people taking um, agency because they feel like they're connected to other people who are doing the same thing. So, okay. <laughs> I have a quick follow-up yeah, question. Follow so like, questions. do you feel like common field is activism then in that case Yeah, too? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I don't think when we started, I mean, honestly, it was like five or six people who felt like we needed each other because our work was really challenging and we just needed mutual support and uh, also felt like our field was completely falling apart. There's a lack of support, financial and otherwise, um, and it's completely undervalued 
and uh, invisible. Uh, many of the times, in like I was reading that paragraph from that article, in light of um, large institutions, it just really goes um, under-recognized. So yeah, I think five years later, we definitely see it as an activist project, and uh, especially because we see ourselves as almost like publishers. We've, uh, one of our founding members, James uh, McAnally, who started a Temporary Art Review, which if you don't know, is a great platform for critical writing, about the field, uh, he, he kind of you know, looked at we, what we were doing and he said, you guys are publishers, you're, you're editing, you're editing ideas and you're bringing together people thinking in write, mainly in writing about what's going on in the field. So we're publishing not just writing but kind of content and thinking um, and programs from across the country. I, I love what you were saying also about um, taking the field into a virtual space. And I'm just thinking about how like even with my objects and sculptures, just you know, thinking about bodies, but then taking the actual into the virtual and how that can be really freeing as well and just kind of opening up, you know, opening up, you know, from 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 the actual to to potential. And uh, um, yeah, you know, through that process of transfiguring, you know. Some things might be lost, but other things might be revealed, and just new connections, and so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's good to hear you say that. I feel like it's important to have both. Is what it comes down mm -hmm. to, because, like the, transformative experience of Mutant Salon, you know, that I experienced, mm -hmm. um, you really need that outside of the virtual space every once in a while. You know, that's why we gather every year and why we travel around the country to meet in person because. It's really important to have that uh, connection, but the only way you connect effectively across such a large geographic boundary <laughs> is to have it online. And also, the first question we asked when we started Common Field was, like, how, what does the field look like? We want to put a face to the field. So our first website, which is no longer in existence because we launched a new website, was like a map with a lot of dots on it. Um, we were really trying to just like beg people by the way, no one wanted to do it. it. It took a lot of convincing. We literally had to like to ask people, we need your help. This isn't about us helping you quite yet. This is about you helping us um, because we are trying to gather everyone together and I think people are skeptical. But then suddenly like enough people did it and then everyone wanted to do it. Kind of like there was a moment where it kind of shifted. I guess I just want to follow up if anyone has anything to speak to this about. I think something that, that comes up with this is the trying to distinguish or not, or how do you think of the blurred lines between um, collaborators or participants and audience mm -hmm. members and, and how you think of who you're doing this work for mm -hmm. and with? Mm -hmm. If anyone has anything they haven't said yet. Mm -hmm. For me, that's really fraught because I'm, I'm, I'm trying always to be really transparent about when I'm doing like a public uh, a procession or a performance. I'm trying to be really transparent about the fact that it's m my work and I'm enlisting uh, people to help me make it. And um, um, I try to make that transaction really, really clear with money and, um, and um, in exchange for time. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and in a weird way that is like so liberatory because then our, our obligations towards each other are, are defined. Um, and, then, and, and then no one really cares about the money anymore. And it, it's funny, because uh, look, those singers that you saw, those, those, they're really expensive. Um, <laughs> but they didn't, they, didn't ask, they didn't ask for that much money from me. And I thought at any moment in the course of the afternoon that they would just stop working and just be like, I need more money or I need a foot massage, or I need something right now. And, um, um, but because at a certain point, when you're working with people and with these transparent transactions, at a certain point, we really are making something together. At a certain point, I'm actually don't, I'm the, I'm the least sort of like crucial element. Um, and I, I always know exactly when that is, when like everybody starts bossing me around. Where I'm like, I'm like, well maybe we should, and they're like, no, we gotta do it again. I, I need another take. Like I'm like okay. So now, now we're now this is ours in this a really interesting way. But for me, I try in this capitalistic world that we live in. I try to like really make that those exchanges clear, so that we we I'm they, they're aware of what I'm asking, 
and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And then, and then um, there's like this ongoing kind of like, um, I don't know, like I have to keep going back because work circulates, so I have to keep going back and asking for things that I didn't know were gonna occur. So that's when it gets murky because their generosity has to extend way further than what they thought. This, I don't know if that no, answers. That yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about like, uh, I loved in the video, there was that moment when it shifts from inside to mm-hmm. outside. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if that, you know, kind of changes things for you in terms of this question of like, you know, participation, audience, you know. Oh, well, uh, that, the inside was the rehearsal. And that to me is like where I'm doing my job, where I'm like, I'm just trying to make all the, all the sort of dominoes line up where they need to. And then the second they went outside, <laughs> I didn't have any control at all. And so, um, um, and, and, and that's, when it, that's when it becomes theirs. And basically what happened in that video, it's not really clear in those two little clips, is that they walked, they did a mile and a half walk along the High Line in the meatpacking district. Um, on a sunny Saturday in, in spring, spring Saturday. It was really crowded and they were really exposed in ways that I actually hadn't anticipated because it's New York. And so I just feel like when you're outside, you just, I don't know, I just, I didn't expect to feel that level of vulnerability. And so the inside to me is like, I'm just like, it's a circle and there's the young people and there's the singing and it's beautiful and we're all together. And then outside, it's actual, I, I feel like it's, it's a bedlam, it's a, a kind of chaos that I, I, they, I have to wait and decide, wait and see if they're gonna actually do it. Like I, I, I was like, this, this, this may not happen. Not because, not because they didn't, not because I didn't think they would, out of a flakeriness or anything, but because of a, a level of difficulty that n- no one really anticipated. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm constantly, I feel like that happens a lot with the kind of uh, processions that I'm trying to do is that um, I'm just setting up parameters and then they're generally successful if they're harder than I thought they were gonna be and messier and, and less successful than I, they're not, they're usually not as pretty as I want or anything, you know what I mean? And that's because at a certain point I'm no longer making it and it's making itself and so it's, it's messy and people are actively resisting, like they, they don't do things out in public that they did in the rehearsal or vice versa, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And they're just deciding that's what's gonna happen. I, I could intervene but I don't, you know what I mean? I think about the idea of inside versus outside all the time, because it's like inside is that safe space where you can have your rehearsal and you're designing something. And then, um, one, yeah, once it goes outside, it becomes completely unknown and there's a public. I think about the Women's Center audience and engagement as a series of concentric circles, where the middle is like the staff and the board, and then there's the programmers and our nodal programs, and then there's the audience who actually comes into the space, and then there's the audience who has never been into the space, but they follow us digitally. And that audience is the biggest one. And in some ways, it becomes this unruly thing where actually they, sometimes it feels top heavy, where it feels like they should, they will have more say because they are larger in quantity than the the ones, like the actual key stakeholders. And so it's this really interesting balance between like really controlling something and then releasing it and having it be public and then the, the there's, an un, there's an unruliness to the public and it becomes this very interesting like porous. See, see, that's the difference between like mm-hmm. activism and, mm-hmm. and like what I do, because I don't need it to stay together. It can oh, fall apart. Yeah. 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 And it doesn't, yeah. I'm, and the something, the, the thing that I'm trying to do, the, like the attempt to sort of destabilize or surprise or undermine people's associations, that will occur either way. Mm-hmm. So if it fails, which these frequently do on some level, um, that I'm, still, I'm still able to produce the kind of like resistance, like visual and physical and sonic resistance that I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up failure because I think in the work of trying to change something, there's a ton of failure, and um, I I think um, I think almost everything we've tried to do at Common Field has failed at least three times before it worked <laughs> out, um, because it's a lot of people who don't always agree, and getting to a place of how to move forward in a way that's collaborative, because we're very collaborative, which isn't always efficient, but it's important as a way to kind of build a certain value system, which we feel really strongly about. So. Um, 
hearing you talk about that just made me think that. And also, um, you know, things aren't working. Things need to change. So invariably, on a weekly, monthly basis, we're really confronting like very difficult things that are happening. And, uh, you know, I don't believe in my prior role as an ED of an art space, I was dealing with similar types of issues, mm -hmm. but confronting kind of um, the larger um, inequities of this field um, and in the arts ecosystem in general um, and the power imbalances that exist. Um, most of the conversations that we organize, they tend to be about very challenging things. And so um, they're not always easy, they're not always, always easy to be a part of, but they're really important. And um, oftentimes, you know, someone gets upset or, but I actually think that if something is, is hard, usually it means it's working in some way. Yeah, I also, um, I love that we're talking about failure now, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, uh, like just failure and, yeah, f you know, failure can be like a, um, yeah, that, like a critique of capitalism, you know, a critique of the impulse to succeed and gain wealth and it, for it to be, you know, that's how a lot of times like success is valued and then you know, also just like a failure to, um, of like nationalism, a failure of, you know, conforming to these standards and, um, yeah, and I, I think about like, you know, like, you know, Zena Zerner, like she's such a failure at being like a real woman, you know, in Mutant Salon, it's like, you know, kind of like safe space for, you know, Experiment, experimentation, you know, failure, like the risk of failing as well, you know, actually taking risks. And then um, if I can also like go back to the um, question of like participant yeah. or collaborator or audience and stuff like that. I'm gonna take this opportunity to um, talk shit about a competing institution, the Broad. And, uh, um, <laughs> You. But, uh, um, you know, and I'm, I'm going to read, like, you know, what happened just because I don't want to implicate, like, uh, people and if I could ask any documenters not to put this online. But I just want to say that, like, oftentimes the dynamic of Mutant Salon is that people from our community come to Mutant Salon and get comfortable and engage with the space, objects, performers in such a way that invites and welcomes other audience members to engage in the experience in the same way. The Broad could not, would not understand this crucial aspect of this project when they wouldn't let most of our community attend who could not afford the $35 price of admission. We were led to believe that it would be a ticketed but free event um, before we signed the contract. And then on top of that, the Pulse nightclub shooting had just happened and they were using us on social media to try to sell tickets. This made many of the performers really angry, many of them being brown, working in nightlife, being poor themselves, ourselves. <laughs> um, in combination with different things, the way the Broad policed this project, our bodies, our activities were exemplary of the same widespread policing and exploitation of our bodies that necessitated this project in the first place. So what we did was in addition to performing in the Oculus Hall or the anus of the museum for paid <laughs> ticket holders, we took the performance to the street just outside of the main entrance of the museum for our sisters, our community, and audience members to experience the performance for free. You know, it was about respecting the space of our collaborators, you know, community, participants, and audience together, and just, yeah, and the, uh, yeah. Just, I guess I, I want to jump a little bit, but not really, because I think in talking about failure and the sense of learning from through multiple trial and error, repetition, um, I, I, I guess I want to ask how, how, histor how historical precedents or histories play a role in your work, and I think Martha did a really great job of reminding us that in these times that feel very dire and immediate and are very dire and immediate, that they also come with a long history of previously dire times and situations. And how, if, if any, how does your, your work pull into that? Uh, or 
or learning well, from histories <coughs> around feminism or activism or any other? I, I actually, literally right now I'm looking at um, someone, uh, I know it was, it was Martha, I was talking about utopia and how you, you can put your energy into that, but there are other things to put your energy into. And I, you know, I'm putting my energy into learning about utopias that succeeded, so sorry. <laughs> no, but um, uh, like sometimes, sometimes people actually do manage to, to, to form a way of living that sustains themselves and others and does as little harm as possible and maybe is very generous and maybe there are things we can learn from. And there are many, many models of this uh, from the... Um, so many, but I'm, I'm just looking at three that are weird, like um, the Shaker, the Shakers, um, and um, Alice Coltrane, and um, the Watts Tower is not Simon Rodia, but the way in which they function as an artery for a part of the city that has very little leverage with uh, the powers that be. Um, really successful models for how to make something that's for other people while also sustaining one's self or like the things that you care about. Um, even when I'm not comfortable with maybe the fundamental sort of spiritual tenets of these communities and maybe it is even those dogmas that make the community successful, I'm still really interested in um, the fact that people are willing to commit themselves to these things and I know that it couldn't have been easy for them either. I know that I'm not it's like some weirdo because I think, it, I think people should just be able to have sex and the Shakers don't agree with that. I think all of those people like, uh, had to deal with that question and they did it anyway because of something. Um, and I'm just, or, or with uh, Alice Coltrane and her music and drawing all these like, you know, black people who are like, meditating all over the country and make, they live together in Malibu and make music. and. Um, and, like, and, 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 and share their land and, and sort of like give the land back. And anyway, so I'm, I'm, in, I'm just interested in like people actually succeeding because we're in, like you said, we're in the middle of something that feels very much like a disaster. And, um, uh, and hypothetical models or even like speculative models are, um, uh, I just think they need uh, shoring up with models of things, even if I disagree with them, even if I find them weird or uncomfortable or retrograde, like they worked on some in some ways. How? Why? What's possible? Doesn't you know what I mean? So yeah, for sure. yeah. I think about that a lot. I think about spirituality a lot in terms of what it means to be part of a community on on the one, an intentional community. On the one hand, it's really wonderful, and you feel like you're really moving towards something, and everybody has a voice, and you're working together. And on the other hand, it's very, very hard to be accountable to so many different people um, who are different. And so I think a lot about the, the Quakers or I, like a spiritual community because I, I, I am not from a spiritual upbringing, but there's something about this element of something that's kind of like unknowable and undefinable, but it's something that is felt that is the thing that can really be a glue and so maybe when I'm, I'm talking about when kind of letting things be viscous rather than um, very like easily defined, maybe this is a way towards occupying an unknowable thing or as a way to build community engagement. I don't know if that's like really woo, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. I can respond just because it's actually something we think about all the time. Um, and we're still so busy trying to build who we are that we keep saying, okay, we'll deal with like the histories next year. But um, Common Field was started um, partly because there was a historic precedent, which was NAO, National Association of Artists Organizations. And there's actually some really important historians in this room who I think could speak a lot about that. But um, Part of why I think it's so important for Common Field to exist, because as we exist, we are building an archive of what's happening right now. And for the most part, those narratives are completely lost. There is actually no narrative, um, there's no visible story of how expansive this work really is. Um, and it lacks the resources often, that's why. Um, 
or they get lost, you know. Like, Neo's archive literally was thrown away by accident. That is what happened. And um, at least once a month, someone calls me and says, like, I have all these papers, can I just give them to you? And I, I'm like, I don't, I live in a tiny apartment, I don't know what to do with them. So we're trying to figure out actively um, how Common Field can kind of take that on. And I think um, we're built on a historic precedent of arts organizing, you know, from like, we think back to, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, the founding of the alternative art space movement, how important that was, you know, Southern Exposure was founded at that time. So running a, what we call like a legacy organization for so long and the responsibility that comes with that. And really what it comes down to is it's a, it's a story of artists that is lost. So the story of arts organizations is truly a story just of artists and their work that needs to be told. So um, I'm very open to ideas. If you have thoughts on how that could happen, please just go onto the Common Field website and let us know. That's how we make all of our decisions for the most part. Um, but yeah, I think um, those stories really do need to be told and preserved. Well, no, you were gonna say well, I mean, I was just thinking about how like amazing, um, like some of the PST shows were too, and, and like the Radical Woman show at the Hammer, and then also just the uh, Axis Mundo show at, at the Pacific Design Center, and just, um, yeah, really just, um, especially not being originally from LA, seeing that legacy of, of really, um, radical practices and just like, you know, and, and, and um, thinking about like uh, working with Lace this summer and just like having, you know, there was a little portion of Lace, uh, the, the Axis Mundo show that talked about like, uh, you know, Lace's radical history of like, um, you know, working with like Chicano uh, uh, queer and femme artists and, um, and you know, I got like really emotional and just like thinking about like really you know, pushing that forward, and then, yeah, I mean, also just, you know, Mutant Salon and, and these other things like Zena Zerner and just taking from the legacy that, like, you know, of, of the gay liberation movement, like, having started in, like, you know, a, a nightlife situation, you know, that these radical things can take place in, like, different contexts, you know. Um, yeah. I don't, I, and like, I, you know, just like having, I know that like, there's so much organization, like year, like for the PST show, some of them like just knowing that there are a bunch of historians working along with curators, working along with like archivists, and, and I don't know, that's so important for all that really rigorous research to happen in a way that artists can't, you know, like do that at all, and so, yeah. And how do they not just get kind of re-forgotten again? Like, how do we keep moving that forward and like have that information be available? I think is an important yeah. question. Yeah. Um, in the interest of it being more of a round table, I thought we could open up to audience questions a little early. Oh. Does anyone have questions? I already I'm not in charge of it. Hi. Um, I had a question for Young and Colleen. Um, I really, Colleen, I really appreciated your sort of like define or uh, challenging the definition or challenging being associated with activism because I kind of put words for for me for like my discomfort around um, around that. I'm curious. Both of you sort of occupy this role of like either literally a director or like a or like a figurehead maybe of a collaborative or what ends up being a collaborative practice and I'm wondering like if you think of it in any term in relation to pedagogy or pedagogical role at all mm. um, and also like not just pedagogical necessarily for like the participants or an audience but like how that relates to like what you're learning from the work yourself. Mm. You. No? 
I mean, I think it's definitely pedagogical. I'm learning all the time from, <laughs> you know, collaborators. And so, like, I, um, yeah, and then just, uh, um, yeah, and, you know, I think that's kind of why, like, the uh, archiving is so important just in terms of, like, you know, the ephemeral nature of the event and then, like, how can it live on and, you know, inspire the children who are not in LA and, you know, in the future and, and, and work off of our failures or our successes or whatever, you know? And I, um, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. okay, but um, I was just thinking that I, I spent a lot of time, I feel like teaching the institution that has invited me to do something that they want one thing and then I have to teach them how to make it something else. Um, I don't have to teach my I, I don't know, collaborators or the people I make the work with because usually I'm going to them because they already do what must be done. But then there's, uh, oh, well, we need to get a permit from the police. No, we don't. Oh, well, we need to do that. No, we don't. No, no, no. Like a, like a, like a, a teaching of like what, what resistance or what public be, bad behavior really looks like and that if you're gonna, if you're gonna do it, then, then do it. And if you don't wanna do it, then don't, then don't. Uh, you can't, there are certain things that are not safe and that are not, you don't ask permission and you don't, even if they're harmless, you just simply do them. You simply offer them, you simply give them away and that is it, that is all. And so sometimes that's like a really long, protracted, difficult conversation with various institutions um, because they have to protect the institution and I have to protect my work and all these people and sometimes like, the, I mean not sometimes but most of the time the, you know, the sort of legal and institutional ways that we protect things are, the, are not the things that protect the people that I, I work with, they're not, they're actually the, the things that are terrifying so that to me is like a constant that's the one way in which I feel like I, I'm learning every, every day all the time how to better communicate with institutions that I want to work with, how we can do, how we can do this, this thing, this particular thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, um, and also, I just, to add to that, I, I um, yeah, which I mean, is, like being, you know, being a, a, like a totally, like a, a a failed director or whatever, or main organizer or something like that. I just like, I wanted to, um, you know, maybe like give a chance to, um, you know, there are a few other people in Mutant Salon that are right here and like I'd like to introduce them and like open it up if you guys wanna, you know, talk about, you know, anything or, or like any concerns or outside of what I said or, you know, that you wanna bring up. Um, yeah, I mean, like, there's Dove Allende, who's a, a poet writer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I just want to support the first a lot of the things that I <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Young. Uh, I just wanted to also agree and confirm a lot of what has been discussed just now recently with Young and Colleen, um, when it comes to the ways of maneuvering um, just policies within an institution, um, in an art institution, things that prohibit, that may prohibit one space to do certain things versus another, um, it's always, um, ha it always has to be inclusive to the audience and the narrative you're talking about um, as a black artist myself that writes and performs. Um, my only experience I can really tell from as of recent is working and being part of Mutant Salon and doing what we did at the Hammer was, I wouldn't say, I would say it was radical, but in the sense where typically I have never seen as many eclectic and non-polished, but yet very nourishing artists presenting themselves as they are, um, except for that one particular time. And it illuminated how the turnout for 
those few days of people coming from not just local, but from the Bay Area. I met people coming from New York just to see exactly like how are we representing ourselves as a collective, but with diversity amongst that. How are we doing that here in LA? Because in this current art scene, there are peers that are still attached to that contemporary aspect of displaying themselves, but it's being influenced by the capital, and it's also being influenced through a gaze that isn't completely eclectic, that isn't representing everything, and representation is very important. However, it isn't inclusive to the allowance of every artist to be able to project a part of themselves to an audience without those provisions of, well, we can't do this because the bodies, you know, the bodies are, they're a little bit, well, we can't do this because this history is, how are you gonna explain growing up in this particular area where violence is very prevalent? But this is real. What I write about is what I do and my art that I write about is not for everybody, but I have been so far and on platforms and institutions where I tell a bit about myself, but it reflects through only being a black femme, a black female, a black individual in a world that sees me and deconstructs what I do. So it's tenfold of the work where I have to put back together a format to give to an audience that might not identify completely because I see maybe less than a hand worth of those who can spot me out and say, oh, I, I'm hearing what they're saying. Um, and fortunately, with Mutant Salon, I'm able to not have to, I don't have to edit half as much as I do if I'm doing a show on my own. So that work is alleviated because I'm with a camaraderie of sisters and the like that understand and it is the most prevalent and beautiful war room of a salon that I've ever been a part of. And hearing also another black artist explain how their experiences of helping and trying to protect their art and the people that are trying to portray their art is so relevant and identifiable. It was frightening as well as enriching watching your film that you just put up. I cannot tell you how powerful that was alone. Just seeing and watching a group of people walk out on the street and one of the most oldest cities of this new country just singing. But in that, you're hearing so much history because our history, our black history, extends through trauma. And everything we do, and I'm talking about black femmes, just being here alone is an act of feminism and activism. Other than that, I am looking and I am learning, but from a non-black point of view of what it is because that's just who we've been. That, that makes me think about, um, just a, a humorous aside, that just makes me think about when I worked for that, when I was an employee of the University of California and they, they made us fill out these forms every semester about our service to the institution and they wanted to know what, uh, like what we were doing for diversity. And I was like, <laughs> every single time I just wanted to write, showing up every damn day. <laughs> and, uh, but I had to write something else, so I feel you. That's all I'm saying, I feel you. <laughs> Any other few minutes? I'm sorry, you have, I think you had a question. You, you've asked a couple times. Yes, you said you had a question. Thank you. I do. Um, I was really struck by um, the conversation around resources. Um, and I'm wondering also if there's more that um, you'd like to say to also tell us about your reference points, um, because I'm learning a lot about that, and also the reparative objectification um, that seems to, to be really central to a lot of the strategies that you're outlining. Um, and I, so I just wanted to really invite you um, to, to give us more reference points, but also the, the one I'd like to bring in is, is um, Asanta Shakur, We Will Win, and also it is our duty to win. 
And um, in the context of maybe, you know, what is failure and what is success and on whose terms, I wondered if um, you could maybe speak about what it would mean to win and to, to overcome. I can't win what? What are we trying to win? Does anybody know? <laughs> I mean, just in, in terms of like reparative objectification and just like kind of counteracting objectification with this another sort of like healing objectification, I mean, or, or just like a kind of radical objectification, like there's a way by which, I mean, like with, you know, like uh, legislation around like, uh, like transgender bathroom bills and stuff like that, like where, you know, it's, literally all like based on um, you know how how you look you know like if if you look like you fit the mold and so you know we really just like need to kind of like um, think about how we look at things um, and assign meaning to them and so no me again, um, but what you said just brought it back to something that had been percolating and maybe is a nice clean way to end, clean question. Uh, there was a lot of discussion of language and the precision of language, and I was wondering if each of you had like a word that you'd like us to stop using or a phrase that you think we should rethink, like something proactive about how we can refine our language better going into the future. <laughs> Oh my God, you should just, like, we can become Facebook friends and then you'll know. <laughs> you'll really know. Um, this is uh, probably pretty basic, but I, I can't believe people are still seeing women artists mm -hmm. rather than just artists. <laughs> and so, I mean, that would be something, an intention that I would want to bring forward is let's just all be artists if that's what we want to be. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have one word. Although we did come up with a way to stop saying modeling or model because it's so complicated to say something's a model. So now we say exampling. Um, <laughs> and it was like a revelation to come up with that word and now we all just try to use it all the time and hope other people start using it. But um, I actually think that uh, it's really empowering to write your own narrative and share it as much as possible. So what worked for us, and it's pretty common for nonprofits, is to articulate a sense of core values and to really have those speak the truth for what we're trying to do and to um, question them regularly and rewrite them regularly. And um, I think um, if you're trying to ask the question about what needs to change, like even just a word, um, behavior, um, accountability, uh, transparency and all the things that maybe don't work in some of these systems, just putting that even out there publicly to share is really powerful. Younger Colleen, any words? Otherwise we can... Clean food. Clean stop. Food. Oh, yeah. Just stop. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. This has been great. <laughs>